It's week two of the 15 days to stop the spread. We have updates about our fight against COVID-19, the Wuhan virus. We'll talk about not just the risks of this pandemic to our health, but also to our economy. You've got a number of U.S. senators in quarantine. One senator already has been positive for it. We'll talk about what happens next and where we're going coming up on The Buck Sexton Show. Those worried and afraid, please know as long as I am your president, you can feel confident that you have a leader who will always fight for you, and I will not stop until we win. This will be a great victory. Welcome to the Buck Sexton Show, everybody. The president trying to reassure us that it's all going to be okay. I think it is going to be okay, but we have some big decisions to make, not just in the months ahead, but in fact, In the weeks ahead, we have decisions that we will have to make about whether or not we allow this virus to fundamentally transform our economy, really to destroy our economy. And that's going to be one of my main focuses today. The president also tweeted out that we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. At the end of the 15 day period, we'll make a decision as to which way we want to go. Look, I've been advocating here that the end of that, that the 15 day period is something we should all try to adhere to as much as we can. Give the government a little more time to figure out what it is that they need, what they have to get. How best to handle this situation. Right. I've been thinking about the best ways for us in our own individual capacity to try and fight against this or prevent the spread of this. But the 15 days was supposed to be allowing the government to get prepared really to play catch up because the government lost time. And I've seen even more information now about the problem, not just with the CDC, but with the FDA. Government agencies are not capable of moving swiftly and decisively. It is it is like against their bureaucratic DNA. If we have time, we'll get into some more of the information on that, how exactly that all fell apart. But. Now we've gone through a week of these extreme measures at different levels. And we have all these uh, on the screens. If you're watching TV or if you're opening up the news, you look at the cases around the world, 350,000 more or less as of today, about 15,300 deaths worldwide, over 100,000 recoveries worldwide, pending cases, 230 plus thousand. That's in a population of, what, seven going on eight billion people? The numbers are actually quite small. And I want to bring to your attention the most interesting analysis of this that I have seen from a true epidemiologist, uh, a person who is honestly able uh, to look at this and not be not be terrified, not not be. Uh, overwhelmed by the pressures of the moment and see where this is all really going. So this is something that's very important for us. The economy is falling apart right now in real time. I I don't want to overstate this. I know we're already dealing with a lot of anxiety. We already have a lot of problems uh, with regard to unemployment. We understand that this is going to spiral out of control very quickly. But the president tweeted this out. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem. It's at the end of the 15 day period. We'll make a decision as to which way we want to go. Okay, that means that when this 15 day period is over, America's got to go back to work. We can't do this. We simply cannot do this. It's not feasible. That's why when I hear things like uh, Governor Cuomo, who I do think is trying to be an adult about this whole situation. I think he's being responsible about this whole situation. When I hear him say this, I'm disheartened because this is not really an option. This is not really a possibility. Here's what he says. Play clip five. This is not a short term situation. This is not a long weekend. This is not a week. Uh, The timeline, nobody can tell you. It depends on how we handle it. Uh, But 40 percent. 
up to 80% of the population will wind up getting this virus. All we're trying to do is slow the spread, but it will spread. It is that contagious. Again, that's nothing to panic over. So the numbers, unless you're older with an underlying illness, etc., uh, it's something that you're going to resolve, but it's going to work its way through society. Uh, we'll manage that capacity rate, but it is going to be four months, six months, nine months. If you look at China, once they really change the trajectory, which we have not done yet, uh, eight months, we're in that range. We're not in that range because we can't be. And this is what the president has woken up to this week. People who understand the economy, who understand macroeconomics, or just forget about macroeconomics, just common sense. What happens when people all of a sudden, after being told they can't, they're not allowed, legally not allowed? You would be violating a state mandate of quarantine if you tried to open up your bar, open up your small business. What happens when those people feel like they're not just losing their businesses, they can't feed their families? $1,200 check from the government here, $1,200 check from the government there. That's not going to do it. That's not going to cover everyone's expenses. What happens then? The government has been so reactive to this because I do think that the press, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I wish it were not the case, but I do believe that the press is, a, a, a portion of them are deeply pleased with the notion that now Donald Trump faces a crisis that is a real crisis, not like Russia collusion, not like the Ukraine phone call and the impeachment fiasco and all the other things they made up, you know, the emoluments clause and Trump is crazy and Trump sexually assaulted somebody in a in a uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, a retail store, or trying to, department stores, we're trying to think of all these crazy stories you've heard. It's all nonsense. Well, this is real. And there's a lot uh, there are a lot of people in the press who like the fact that now they have a crisis that they can bash Trump with. And we'll get into this. This is real. I mean, the politics of this are becoming very apparent. And I have to tell you, I am really sick and tired of people in the media and in positions of perception authority right now, right? Perceived authority, whether it's to give us information or it's government officials. I've gotten really sick and tired of them saying this isn't political. And then they go on to say something grotesquely political. And I'm supposed to sit there and go, oh, OK, well, it's not political. So I'll just let them keep doing what they're doing. The dishonesty here, uh, the lack of seriousness from the left and from the libs is greatly concerning. Uh, it really is. But we have to uh, focus on, on the first order of business here. Yeah, of course, the, the rescue package is delayed. I'll bring you up to speed on that. Nancy Pelosi is a person of no ethics, no integrity, no honor. That's not a surprise. We all knew that. People are suffering. The working class, the Democrats pretend to care so much about are the ones who are suffering the most. They are in true fear for their livelihoods and small business owners are going to watch as everything that they've built disappears. Do you think anyone's going to write them a check for the uh, restaurant that they spent five, ten years with their own hands Late nights, tough months, scrimping, saving, doing everything they could to try to keep it going. And finally, they've got a good customer base. They've got decent cash flow. You know, maybe they're operating on five, seven percent profit margin for all all their, uh, you know, all their expenses year in and year out. And that shuts down. Guess what? The government's not going to pay you for that entity. The best thing that they could possibly do is try at this point that they're talking about is trying to help you keep payroll going for a while, but you still have rent. You still have other expenses. And it's just not going to work. We all know this. So we've been so focused on, is this virus going to kill all of us, basically? That's really been the perception. And the answer is no, it's not. Not even close. If we did absolutely nothing, if we were running around, high-fiving, kissing each other on the cheek constantly, uh, gathering in large numbers, going out and partying, doing what these Generation Z people, by the way, don't blame us on the millennials, Gen Z. I'm watching you down on spring break. Millennials now are, most of them, late 20s, into their 30s, 
lot of them are married. A lot of them have kids. Gen Z was, I don't mind letting them pull this. Gen Z were the ones that were doing shots of Soco and Lime and Jägermeister down in Clearwater and wherever else they were gathered in, uh, in Florida until they shut the beaches down there. But now is when we start to recognize we can't keep doing this. This doesn't work. The government isn't going to be able to turn the economy back on because the economy is going to be dead. And those who were saying, Buck, this is about protecting life. I, I saw there was a Cuomo line, I think from Friday, but it might have been over the weekend, that he'll be happy with all these measures if it saves just one life. No, that's a terrible idea. We accept that there are a lot of things that we don't do that would save lives, but the cost to the rest of our existence isn't worth it. The one that everyone always points to is driving, right? 30 to 40,000 fatalities from driving in the United States every year. Okay, but what are we supposed to do about that? If we drove at 20 miles an hour everywhere, there would probably be uh, hundreds instead of tens of thousands of, of vehicle fatalities, maybe a few thousand. I mean, it would cut it down. If the speed limit was strictly enforced, at 20 miles an hour, if somebody went over 20 miles an hour, you take their car away. You're going to tell me that's not going to cut down. But think about what that would be like to live. What would that mean for commerce? What would that mean for you getting home, you getting to work, you getting around? Those are trade-offs. We're going to have to have a serious adult American conversation about the trade-offs here. The president has talked about this in the context of it being a war. And I, I think that's a useful way to speak about this but we must remember that in wars there are casualties and i know we're already taking some and every loved one that we lose you know for every family where someone dies from this virus it's a tragedy but we also have to understand that for every family where someone dies from flu from h1n1 from heart failure from cancer from accidents in and around the home those are all tragedies too just as tragic we seem to have frightened ourselves into a corner here where we think we have to do everything and anything because we have to make sure that there is a bare minimum risk from this instead of a manageable risk from this. Those are not the same thing. If we try this bare minimum risk approach, we risk, in fact, no, we don't risk. If we continue with this bare minimum risk approach, we're going to destroy the United States economy and with it, There'll be civil disorder, riots in the streets, mass noncompliance, class warfare that actually starts to look like warfare. This is going to get really ugly. And people's livelihoods, uh, intergenerational economic destruction, all of this will occur. And it's really almost a near certainty if we continue on this current path. The government is just running on money created by us. The only reason the United States government is the powerhouse it is is because of U.S. economic activity, right? Any country can print money. The reason American money is so valuable is because of the assets, the ingenuity, the capital, human and otherwise, of the United States of America, our industry, our commerce, our capitalism, our system. This is why people trust us to pay our bills. This is why we're the reserve currency. And we're now at risk if we continue doing this, not just on the civil disorder side, which I think is very apparent. We're also effectively going to be running an experiment that would run close to what you call modern monetary theory. I've talked to you about this before. This is the AOC far left wing Bernie Sanders economic advisor approach to an economy. Don't worry. Just write the check. Doesn't matter how big it is, doesn't matter how big your deficit is, whatever you want, whatever you think is a social good, write the check for it. Figure it out later. Just try to manage, just quote, try to manage inflation, unquote, right? That's what they'll say. And this is a way, the problem with inflation is that usually when it sets in, it's very hard for governments to deal with. And if inflation gets bad quickly because the market is speaking, not just because policymakers are saying one thing or another, guess what? Then all of a sudden you could have the complete annihilation of an economy, which has happened in countries. We've seen this happen. People are talking about Weimar Republic and Germany. Look at Zimbabwe. Look at what's going on in Venezuela. These economies effectively barely exist. I mean, they're back to almost trade and barter. 
because of what's been done to their currency. We're going to start spending a trillion dollars here, a trillion dollars there on top of $22 trillion of debt. The people who have been worried about U.S. debt being too high for decades, you were all correct. You've always been correct. How many times have I said in short segments on this show in the last year, those who, of you who have really been with me here in the hut uh, day in and day out, how many times have I said, look, no one, wants, no one cares, but the debt's too high. We all know it. No one cares, though. Things are good. I'm just telling you it's too high. I know people don't want to hear about it. Well, now everyone's saying, wow, it was kind of fiscally irresponsible to spend a trillion dollars when the economy was a, a trillion dollars more than we were taking in to run up the debt by a trillion dollars a year. That was fiscally irresponsible when things were rocking and the economy was great. And it was, but nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wants to believe there's no Santa Claus, especially when there are politicians who say, oh, yeah, I'm Santa Claus. The Democrats. We can't keep doing what we are doing right now for long. Maybe, maybe we could stretch this out into the next month, maybe the middle of April. But right around what used to be known as tax day, now it's been pushed to July 15th, right around the middle of April, if we have this complete shutdown of business in place, we are looking at national, we are looking at national economic suicide. We are heading for Great Depression Two. A 30% jobless rate is on the horizon. That's unsustainable, even in the short term. Can't do it. We have been through pandemics before. We have been through wars before. I think we've gotten very comfortable in America and in this society thinking that we'll never have to make the tough choices again. A tough choice is telling people to stay home. You know what's a really tough choice? Telling people that we're going to put some measures in place, but we are going to go to work and we're going to lose people to this virus but we're also not going to allow the country to completely collapse. That is a really tough choice. That will require real leadership, and we have to push them right now to do that. I think it's part of my duty not just to inform you about what's going on right now in the midst of this true national crisis, uh, I, I also think I need to make the argument here, need to make the case about why we, we can't continue these measures. And I understand there will be costs. I understand this is going to be very difficult, but I want to make the case today and this week why we're in week two of the 15 days. This is it. After this, we still practice some sensible social distancing. We still take measures to protect our vulnerable population. No question about it. Tremendous expenditure of resources at the personal and all throughout government level to protect those who are in the more vulnerable population. But a lot of the rest of us need to be told, if you want to go in and work and you want to try to conduct normal business, you are allowed to do it, even though you are aware of the risks and there will be risks and we will lose people. But as I've been saying, if this is a war, we should expect that there will be losses and we need to make policy based on what is best for all of us not what is best for eliminating risk, because we can never do that. I want America to understand this week it's going to get bad and uh, we really need to come together as a nation. I, I heard the stories that you were just playing young people out um, on beaches. Uh, we, we see here in D.C. Uh, that, that the uh, district set up a cam for people to watch the cherry blossoms. You look on the cam, you see more people walking around than you see cherry blossoms. And this is how the spread is occurring. And so we really, really you don't need think people are taking it seriously. I think that there are a lot of people who are doing the right things, but I think that unfortunately we're finding out a lot of people think this can't happen to them. When you look at what's going on in New York, yeah. and we said this at the beginning of our 15 days to stop the spread initiative, that the numbers you see reflect what happened two weeks ago. We don't want Dallas or New Orleans or Chicago to turn into the next New York, and it means everyone needs to be taking the right steps right now, and that means stay at home. Yeah. Okay, for two weeks, it's in doing enormous damage already to the economy. Let's understand that even with a even with a two week uh, policy in place like this of lockdown, we are risking massive economic damage. And I want to tell you about that. So we all understand we're heading right now. The estimates are we're heading for a 30 percent 
joblessness rate. If we stay on this current course, 30%. Anybody want to guess what the jobless rate was in the Great Depression? 25%. Does anyone really think that we're going to be able to snap back out of this? We did not in 1918 have a total secession of all activity in response to this. And then we did historically just go back and look what happened after 1918, 1919, a period in America known as the Roaring Twenties. Tremendous growth, prosperity, relative peace. Didn't last too long overall, but the Twenties were good. That's what happened. And we lost millions of Americans in that circumstance. Now, I understand millions of Americans right now, that would, that would seem to be too high a cost for anyone to bear. But we have a much better health care system now than we did then. We have much better treatments in general, meaning ventilators, you know, much better procedures in place, perhaps is the way to say it, than we did in 1918 to help people that had interstitial pneumonia, which is a very scary thing. And I understand that comes with a lot of the very dangerous cases of this. But we, we don't really have data to support the annihilation of the U.S. economy. By the way, I am going to take the Democrats to task for what they've done here with holding up this uh, aid bill that everyone agrees is needed. Uh, the Democrat, uh, Democrat Party is a disgrace. I mean, they are true national hostage takers. Pelosi and Schumer are unethical, scummy, disgraceful people. I, we'll get there. But I, I want to focus to start out with on right now this key decision making the calculation about what is acceptable for us in terms of losses and what we need to do in order to get the economy running again. By the way, the economy is not going to be off to a gallop. That's not going to happen. I'm just saying we need to get some stuff going here. We need to get businesses moving to the degree that we can, because otherwise there's not going to be an economy to restart. Keeping this shutdown going as is, much longer than this week. And I've given, remember, I said the 15 days, fine. That's what they say they need to get ready for this, 15 days. That does, that's not four months. It's not even 30 days. So the president, I think, understands this. He knows the status quo cannot hold. I am seeing all these messages from people and hearing from people everywhere that they're going to lose everything. People put their hearts, their lives, uh, their, their heart and soul everything into building a career, building a business, saving up some money, trying to make sure they're up with their bills. What happens now? The federal government's not going to make anybody whole who whose business is gone. It's not going to happen. You can't just rehire all the people that have been fired as businesses have closed down. Think about all the time it'll just take to untangle the insurance claims that are going to come out of this, the and all the lawyered up bureaucratic minutia that this is going to. Go, I mean, it's just going to be a mess, a mess. And America is going to have to go to uh, work very soon, because even if that means there are more casualties from COVID-19 than would occur under this uh, continued extreme shutdown. It doesn't matter. And this is a hard thing to say, but it is reality and we need to accept it and act on it now. I could die from COVID-19. Anyone listening to this could also die from COVID-19. And no matter what the government does, that is not going to change. We are simply trying to deal with risk, risk management, which bureaucracies are notoriously bad at doing. And a lot of that risk management is on an individual level. What are you willing to do? What do you think is safe for you? Now, part of that risk management has to be, what does the country look like if we just go into this this state of hibernation? I mean, this is economic hibernation. And then we try to revive ourselves in three months or six months. Now, I do think that the warmer, the warmer period ahead will be a godsend. And that alone, based on what we see, and this experts are saying this too. So don't be like, fuck, you're not an epidemiologist. I'm reading people who all they do is study this. And they're saying, look, it would be strange if there was not a dramatic slowdown in this virus just from the change in seasonal temperature. 
But when you see things like this, I mean, you've got GDP predictions for the second quarter, according to Goldman Sachs, range from horrible down 8% to catastrophic down 15%. But Goldman Sachs actually just came out with a new research note this week. Now, you might say, oh, Goldman Sachs. Yeah, but they're trying to assess what's happening to people's money. Trust me, Goldman Sachs cares about money. A research note with a a projection for GDP loss in the second quarter of 2020 suggests Goldman Sachs believes that the United States GDP will be down 24%. We can't do this. We can't do this. We can't do that because even if you look at the possibility of hundreds, and remember, we've only lost uh, to- in total right now in the United States, what, we're, we're in the hundreds of people who have been killed by this virus. If we lost hundreds of thousands of people from this, it would be similar to a very bad flu season, right? I mean, if we lost, let's say, 100,000 people, you've had up to 60, 70,000 from the flu, and no one even really you know, talked much about it. I mean, H1N1 infected tens of millions. And people say, don't be a flu truther. I'm not a flu truther. We're trying to assess real risk here. You can go out and get the flu during flu season in particular, but you can go out and get the flu and come home, and that's all she wrote, no matter who you are. It can shut down your system. If you catch a bad flu, you can die from it. Fact. Do you not leave your home? Do you insist that no one else leave their home? Do you have the government telling you that, whoa, we we can't have the loss of 50,000 people this year from flu, so no one's allowed to do anything? That's what we're doing right now. And I understand. I've seen all the scary stuff about Italy. I've seen, yeah, but we have two weeks of preparation here to get masks and everything in place. We have had social distancing. People are taking it in many places more seriously. I'm here in the epicenter, by the way. I'm here in New York City, which has by far the the greatest concentration of cases. And New York State, because of New York City, is a state that is worst, has been the worst hit by this. I mean, cases in New York, 20,875. 157. We, by the way, we've had 463 total deaths from this so far. We, we've had more people die. While this has been going on, we've had more people die from the flu than have died from this. That's just a fact. Meaning that while COVID has been spreading in the United States, more people have died from flu. Now, people can say, oh, it's worse than the flu and higher mortality. Those people don't know what the mortality is. Stop with the panic. We have to, we have to present facts and rationality here we can't do this based on emotion no one wants anyone to die of any disease in this country but trying to ensure an almost zero risk factor for people could create much worse risks for everybody systemic risks think about how many people die from suicide from untreated illness because the medical system will be a fraction of what it used to be because people will be out of work. Who makes the masks? Who makes the ventilators? All the things that our doctors, and God bless our doctors, nurses, first responders, everybody who's on the front lines of this, but all the tools that they use to fight against us come from the private sector, comes from commerce and business and industry. We need those things to keep working or else we're not going to have a medical sector to speak of. We're not going to be able to fight against other diseases, too. So this is why I think it's so important right now that we all understand there needs to be a shift in the national mindset on this. We need people to be able to go back to work. We need social distancing to be a standard. We need elderly populations and those with compromised immune systems to be on lockdown but the government has to wake up. This is not this is not an option. What they think is an option, three months, six months, nine months, is not an option. It's catastrophe. And we're still going to have a lot of people get sick and still going to have a lot of people die from, uh, from COVID-19 no matter what. It's not going to change. So we really just have to look at what is acceptable. And at some point, that's going to mean having a conversation about casualties, just as you would in any war. A war isn't worth fighting for, you know, you talk about a war of self-defense, even a war of self-defense at a certain point, if your casualties are too high, you'll just capitulate. Fine. The other side wins. 
That's what that's what ends up happening in a war. Right now, we can't capitulate against a virus. But in any wartime scenario, you're looking at the number of casualties and you're making decisions and assessments, understanding that there will be casualties that's going to happen. And you're trying to just assess what are acceptable numbers of that. We are going to suffer casualties from COVID-19. We already have suffered a few hundred, which I- I'm going to walk you through the numbers on this. And I think you'll see, and th- not from me, this is from a, an epidemiologist at Stanford University School of Medicine, one of the premier medical schools in the country, in the world. And I'll walk you through point by point what he is saying about this. Because I think we have we the we are over we are overreacting if we extend this shutdown of business beyond this week. That's where I am. And I, all, all I do is think about this. All I do is read about this, talk to the smartest people I know. And I, I'm just not seeing the case for this continued shutdown. I'm not seeing the case for this to extend beyond where we already are. And I am really you know, I'm not terrified of us against coronavirus. We'll win. We'll get through it. I do get scared when we start to see the government thinking, yeah, we're going to have extra judicial detainment authority, which there are reports that are asking for in certain circumstances regarding quarantine. We're going to shut down businesses. We're going to deploy, you know, government uh, resources of force, police, deputizing people at the state level, making sure that all these mandates are enforced. The, you know, GPS tracking of individuals with this. This starts to get scary real quick. And the thing that's scarier to me than this virus is the government mishandling this and destroying the entire United States economy and taking the Constitution down with it. That's now the enemy that we face in addition to the virus. I was in New York City yesterday. It was a pretty day. There is a density level in New York City that is wholly inappropriate. You would think there was nothing going on in parts of New York City. You would think it was just a bright, sunny Saturday. Uh, I don't know what I'm saying that people don't get. I'm normally accused of being overly blunt and direct. And I take that. It's true. I don't know what they're not understanding. This is not life as usual. None of this is life as usual. And this kind of density, we talk about social distancing. I was in these parks. It, you, would not, you would not know that anything was going on. This is just a mistake. It's a mistake. It's insensitive. It's arrogant. It's self-destructive, it's disrespectful to other people, and it has to stop, and it has to stop now. Now, I can't speak to what Cuomo saw in parks, but I can speak to being out in New York yesterday, walking on the street, which you are allowed to do. I was walking the dog, Tallulah. He's very cute. She knows something's up, too. She knows the humans do not seem to be in good moods these days. Uh, but I, I took her on a walk all all through some of the most from Midtown down to what you consider to be the start of uh, Flatiron, uh, which is right before the village in New York City. These these are I'm bringing it up just because these are the most densely packed parts of New York. Usually it's a ghost town. There's nobody on the streets. I walked through areas that would usually be just bumping with people out to brunch and bars and. You know, watching the game, I know there's no games right now. Uh, went to Madison Square Park, one of my favorite parks in New York, formerly where Madison Square Garden, the uh, place where the Knicks and the Rangers play, used to be. Uh, and I went to check this out, and I'm telling you, yeah, there were some people on the streets, but there were, it was not packed. And, and what I saw was a lot of businesses shut down that they rely on people coming in on Sundays to buy things, to get food, to just engage in commerce. Shutdowns everywhere, all over the city, because the the initial guidance about or the mandate about this went into effect. So I can't speak to what's going on in Prospect Park out in Brooklyn or whatever, but I can speak to this is really scary. I mean, the city should not be shut down in this way for long. 
because it's not going to survive it. And I, I know that for a lot of you, you're like, oh, Buck, this isn't really this doesn't really affect us out here. There are going to be more outbreaks in other states and there are going to be clusters of this. So you, you never know when this is going to hit. But also understand that, you know, if things get bad enough in New York City. Uh, that has an effect not just on the national economy, but also people are going to start trying to leave New York to go to other places. And what are we going to have then? You know, people are going to want to go. They've already been doing this. They've already been trying to find places to seek refuge in other states, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, more rural parts of Connecticut. Uh, so that's already happening. If New York starts to get out of control, guess what? You're going to have people that are trying to do everything they can to leave. What are you going to do? You're going to tell them no cars on the roads. No one's allowed to go anywhere. So I didn't see the, the New York that Cuomo did there. I saw one that's on. I saw New York City on life support this weekend on a beautiful spring weekend life support. That's what I saw. 